Welcome to Data Cloud Now's Gen AI and LLM's Leadership Series. In today's episode, we're in New York City, exploring the role Gen AI is having on data and talent. To explore this topic further, I'm delighted to be joined by Gotham Biliapa, Managing Director, AI and Data Engineering at Deloitte. Gotham, such a pleasure to have you on the program Thank you today. for having me, such a pleasure to talk to you. Everyone is focused on harnessing the power of Gen AI in LLMs for their respective organizations. However, why is it fundamental to start with the collective data strategy before addressing the impact AI can bring? That's a very good question. Um, in the last six months, everybody's become an expert in generative AI. I was looking at a coconut water company the other day that said they are powered by generative AI. So what this has done in the market is we had somewhat of a fragmented data state. This is increased the amount of confusion and the fragmentation in the market. And I look at it, this from three vectors. The first is the architecture perspective. The second is the vendor perspective. And the third is where are you actually going to get the yield of the game, yeah. From an architecture perspective, about 15 years ago, we had kind of a split in the data ecosystem with the emergence of Hadoop to cheaper processing. So we split all the data workloads from you know, data warehouse and then machine learning, big data, and so on and so forth. That, those worlds haven't come together. With the advent of technologies like uh, Snowpark Container Services, we can now converge the worlds and we can have a data warehouse workload and an AI ML, uh, generative AI workload, all interacting on the same data and it removes the sprawl from the organization. The other point is, like I said, every vendor is now an expert in generative AI. Your CRM vendor, your ERP vendor, your HR vendor, as your cloud vendors, and then your data vendors like Snowflake experts in generative AI. And what this is leading to is a dilution of the resources that companies are applying to generative AI. Without a holistic strategy, we're seeing companies run 20, 30, 40 different initiatives on generative AI, but none are able to make it a production because the energies are so diluted. And this comes to the last point on business unit density, uh, which is not only is technology like the CDO working on generative AI, so is the CIO because they're getting pressure from all the vendors, but so are all the business unit functions. So the net it all out is, you know, do you realize a value through a go-to-market product and get your revenue? Do you save OPEX, right? Or do you do something else? Do you do it with your ERP vendor? Do you do it with the cloud vendor? Do you do it with the data vendor? This is why you need a holistic data strategy because the interest is very high, the noise is very high. Actually, the investment is also very high, but it's very diluted. This converges that and then, you know, the clients who do well are the ones who are able to prioritize initiative and you know, focus on one or two vectors and get the yield from it. Pratham, thank you so much. It's great to have a baseline. Now let's dive into the topic at hand, Gen AI and talent. Awesome. What are the top things organizations can do with AI to empower their workforce? Yeah, so good point. Like uh, when we were speaking last time, I said mediocrity is now free. Right. Whether you want to write a mediocre piece of code, you want to generate a mediocre script, you want to generate a mediocre image, you want to generate a mediocre interview, right? It, it, this could have been powered by generative AI if we did one excellence, right? And we didn't need you. The, the, the problem with that is um, uh, companies who, who are able to monetize it, monetize excellence. In order to be excellent or something, you need, you need that talent that can ride on top of generative AI, get the yield from it, prompt it so they're able to get the yield. So this is leading to a fundamental shift in pretty much every business function. We're seeing shifts in HR, we're seeing shifts in uh, call centers, we're seeing shifts in sales, right? Uh, we're seeing shifts in finance even, as well as technology. Um, so companies are having to navigate the, cha the challenges that requires the skill sets and their talent in order to get you know, yield from this. This is part one. And part two of two is, uh, who is actually going to work on generative AI? What skills do you need for generative AI? Apart from the business unit skills that are going to evolve through generative AI, and this is leading, leading to a seismic shift in not only those machine learning data scientists are very hard to find, but who are the prompt engineering skills that didn't exist before, right? Who are the ethicists, you know, skills that didn't uh, uh, exist before? Who are the governors that like governing the skills, understanding the regulatory impact? So this is the seismic shift they're seeing in industries uh, today. You know, thank you for that, Gotham. And we're going to dive into some of that a little bit later in this discussion. What are the top two challenges, though, in bringing AI to the teams? Awesome. Uh, the first challenge is, um, I think, fluency. So we just ran a fluency session for a media and entertainment client. Uh, 
th this was a client who was quite sophisticated. They sent the invite to 11,000 people within the finance and technology division, wow. right? Yeah, we had 600 attendees who were, who were very well, you know, attenuated, attenuated the discussion. But just in finance and, uh, uh, and IT, uh, the invite was sent to 11,000 people. So you can see the number of, number of personnel within one organization, and this is relatively not the biggest organization, that are impacted by generative AI. So the first part is fluency, just because every function is going to be impacted by generative AI developing a fluency. Uh, the, the other impact is the, the pace at which we're seeing uh, functions being impacted, it's it, not all companies are able to keep, keep track of the change. So we're seeing kind of a sprawl happening where you know, there's a separation between the winners and losers of people adopting it quickly and not. And we're seeing that across organizations as well. Right? Uh, and uh, you know, th there's a big feeling like with the writer's strike and all that happening in the media and entertainment industry that there's a significant impact on the workforce and the commercial term, all of that that has to evolve because of gender AI. I'm so glad you mentioned workforce. Yeah. Uh, you know, as we are aware, AI builders are sought after talent. Mm -hmm. But with the critical role of data in AI, what other roles are needed in order for a company to be successful across the board? Yeah, so um, there, there's a saying that goes, when software fails, it's very loud. When AI fails, it's very soft. Nobody knows that it failed and you know, you're messing it up. So the thing about it is, is that the quality of data has not significantly improved, but the quantity of data has increased exponentially. So the challenge of organizing your data, understanding the quality, even if you're not able to get it 100%, still remains, and taking the focus out of that will mean that your software failures and your AI failures will just, you know, rev at, at a higher frequency, you'll see a higher rate of failures. So that's, you know, topic one in, in you know, organi uh, organizing your data. Uh, wh what else can I tell you about that, you know? Yeah. <laughs> and that's why we're here at this conference with Snowflake, you know? No, yeah. I, I appreciate it, Gotham. In, yeah. in a world uh, of LLMs where models always have an answer, regardless of whether it's, it's right or wrong. What do you think about talent training in this new age of AI? Yeah, so one thing is don't believe everything you hear and don't believe everything you see. But it's very hard for us who trust technology so much to give us the right answer. LLM is totally new where the quality of answer may be unknown. For example, we had a client where we had like many vintages of a document. It came up with an answer where there's a citation to every portion of the document, but the assembled sentence didn't exist in any one document, right? So it made up the truth, but it was very realistic because every single segment, right, or uh, token ha had a lineage. Uh, so in this age, uh, us understanding, you know, how to look for the truth, how to validate the truth is very important. Uh, the, and we're seeing that people confuse the role of machine learning and the m world of uh, generative AI, which is, where do you need 100% reliability, rely on math, outsource that to a math function or an ML function? Where do you need a narrative made up by generative AI, where low precision in the narrative is okay? Uh, so these are things to keep in mind that, that, you know, that organizations are not yet aware of is how to build trust in the technology and actually how to build lack of trust in the technology given hallucinations. You know, Gotham, I know we've covered a lot but what would you like to share to the audience watching? What can they start doing today to make this transition for their workforce? I think the first thing is fluency, uh, like I'd mentioned previously. Uh, our partners like Snowflake, AWS, and many others out there have basic fluency courses to understand you know, uh, what generative AI is about and, uh, and how it actually impacts your business function. So I think fluency, is a, a key point. The other thing is uh, understand ethics. Ethics, uh, it kind of was kind of an obscure topic back in the past, but what people don't understand is all these models are built by, let's call them tech bros, is a very narrow demographic of tech folks. who are very good at tech, but don't actually understand where these models are going to be applied in the future, yeah? So how do you balance a model built by a community that has an inherent bias, all of us do, is you know, tech fellows, right? Uh, to where it's going to be applied is part one. Part two is the training data has its own inherent bias in the demographic of data actually available, right? Uh, so there was a case where a bank had trained the model on uh, loan improve, uh, sorry, credit card approval data from data that went back prior to women being able to have credit cards. So think of the decision that large wow. language model is making 
based on the historical <laughs> fact that, data that it's that, that it's working that, off of. that it's working off of right so while the model is awesome and amazing based on the available data it has inherent bias because of the data that was available to train the model so now ethics is becoming very important uh, understanding bias mitigating bias right uh, and, and the complexity of this is uh, the question comes up is where do you mean mitigate bias do you mitigate bias in the technology but technologists like me, I have no clue what the application in HR or credit card approvals or government is, is but, but we can all build a model and bring it to production, right? Do you regulate it in the technology or do you regulate it in the use case, right? So these are questions that are coming up, but they're kind of under the table. So, but I think they're go going to become very important. They're going to be new roles that emerge. They're going to be new regulations that emerge. And it's a very exciting time. Gotham, really appreciate your time, your perspective and insights on this topic. Thank you so much for joining me on Data Cloud Now. My pleasure. Always a pleasure talking to you. Thank you so much for having me. Let's continue the conversation in a couple months from now because it's likely could have changed as well. Exactly, and it will. For the audience watching, I'm Ryan Green with Data Cloud Now. I'll see you soon.